For all its captivating beauty, Glacier National Park harbors a dark and tragic moment in American history. Within the park, on the same night, just hours apart and with no relation to each other, two 19-year-old women were brutally mauled to death by hungry grizzly bears, forever changing the way we view our relationship to these wild places. In the northwest corner of Montana, adjacent to the Canadian border, lies the crown of the continent, more commonly known as Glacier National Park. With over 1 million acres of forests and alpine vistas, it's no surprise that the park sees millions of visitors each year, each one in awe of this enduring spectacle of nature. Areas such as Lake McDonald, Going to the Sun Road, and the Continental Divide are wildly popular sites, but one of Glacier's greatest attractions is the variety of wildlife. In fact, the park practically teems with wildlife. The diversity of its landscape provides a haven for over 70 species of mammals and over 260 species of birds. But of course, one of the park's most infamous species is the North American brown bear, also called the grizzly bear. With a top speed of 35 miles per hour, the strength to move over a thousand pounds, and a bite force capable of crushing a bowling ball, grizzlies are one of the most dangerous creatures in the entire world. They tend to be solitary creatures and have been known to act aggressively when their personal space is disturbed. Because of this, visitors to Glacier are highly encouraged to observe all safety precautions, especially in heavily visited areas where humans can roam freely. In 1967, Glacier National Park had been operational for 57 years, and in all that time there hadn't been a single recorded death due to a grizzly attack. But as the park grew more popular, the wildlife there, including grizzlies, suddenly found themselves living alongside a new species, and one that left behind a lot of food. It's hard to believe now, but early in park history, visitors weren't discouraged from feeding the bears, and few precautions were taken to keep bears out of trash receptacles. In fact, visitors were encouraged to view bears as they rummaged through leftovers. Gradually, the bears began to associate people with food, and though some park officials recognized the dangers, no one could have predicted that in the decades since its opening, this familiarity with humans was brewing a deadly storm. The evening of August 13, 1967 was dry, though marked by distant flashes of lightning. 19-year-old Michelle Coons hiked with a dimpled grin toward Trout Lake in Glacier National Park. Joining her were her four close friends, Paul Dunn, Roy Nosek, Ray Nosek, and Denise Huckle. As they trekked through patches of berries, a concerned passerby warned the group of a bear circling the area. With the abundance of food growing out of the ground that surrounded them, this was heaven for a hungry bear. Shrugging their shoulders with little concern, the group continued toward the lake. Surely ready to collapse from miles of hiking, they finally arrived at their destination. After setting up camp and making hot dogs and trout, the friends did indeed spot a bear combing the area around them. Unbeknownst to them, this same grizzly was responsible for creating chaos and ravaging the park throughout the season. She would stalk guest cabins, ransack campsites, and at one point she even harassed a group of Girl Scouts, only backing off after stealing their food. Scrawny and emaciated, she always appeared on the hunt for food, and as opposed to the other bears in the park, she never fled on account of humans. Despite this concerning behavior, park management took no action towards stopping it. Still, even after this sighting, the group saw no reason to be concerned. After all, in Glacier, a death due to a bear attack was unheard of. Still, just to be on the safe side, they agreed to move their campsite and sleeping bags to the shore of Trout Lake. The campers then lit a bonfire in hopes of keeping away the predator, but also likely to enjoy a calm, crackling fire. Succumbing to their exhaustion after an ideal, warm summer evening, the friends fell asleep. Eventually, though, the fire began to die down, leaving the slumbering group dangerously exposed. At around 4 a.m., the campers heard rustling beside them. The emaciated grizzly had returned and was rummaging through their campsite. Remembering the common advice given for bear encounters, the group laid still beneath their sleeping bags, hardly daring to breathe. Hearts racing, they hoped the grizzly would grab whatever food from their supply and then leave. But when the bear ripped open Paul Dunn's sleeping bag, he couldn't lie still any longer. He jumped up and ran. Surprised by the sudden movement, the bear retreated to the tree line, but not for long. The bear returned, and this time Denise Huckle and Roy Nosek jumped up and fled, praying that the predator wasn't following them. Fortunately, it wasn't. Once again, not sure what to make of the situation, the bear had been startled away. But instead of giving up, the bear once again returned to the campsite. Noticing his friend's successful fleas, Ray Nosek now ran to the trees as well. Now, the only member of the group remaining at the campsite was Michelle. From the tree line, all four friends pleaded with Michelle to run to them, but it's believed that Michelle's sleeping bag zipper was stuck, preventing her from escaping. As the group climbed the trees to reach safety, they heard Michelle's gut-wrenching cries for help. 
From the branches, they watched helplessly as the bear tore her arm from her body. And after what must have felt like hours, Michelle managed to shriek her last words. Oh my god, I'm dead. The group waited in the trees until the following morning. After some time passed with no sign of the grizzly, they sprinted to the Lake McDonald Ranger Station, where Rangers Bert Gildar and Leonard Landa responded to their frantic pleas for help. Once arriving at the campsite, the two rangers began yelling for Michelle. Walking into the woods, Leonard spotted a small piece of flesh and after following a trail of blood, they discovered Michelle's mangled body, 40 feet from the site. The rangers loaded Michelle into a body bag that was delivered by helicopter and she was turned over to the local coroner. Distressed, Bert and Leonard set out to kill the murderous grizzly, rifles in hand. They searched the entire day, but as the sun set, efforts had come to no avail. The following morning, however, the rangers awoke to a startling surprise. Thirty feet from the ranger station, sitting on its haunches and looking out over Trout Lake, was the grizzly who'd been such a nuisance in Glacier all summer and who'd now taken a human life. Bert and Leonard quickly grabbed their rifles and went to face the bear, but instead of scattering as any other bear would, the savage animal charged toward Bert. Perhaps emboldened by its recent mauling, it was afraid of no man. The two rangers fired their rifles and mid-charge, the bear crumpled to the ground. The deceased bear was transported away from the park for forensic analysis. They sliced open the bear's stomach and retrieved a ball of blonde, human hair. This evidence confirmed that indeed this was the animal that killed Michelle. The analysis also noted glass embedded in the bear's teeth from devouring garbage, which made it extremely difficult for the bear to consume food. Because of this, the 20-year-old grizzly was desperately famished, weighing 500 pounds less than the average bear of its age. But Michelle Coons wasn't the only mauling to occur on that tragic Sunday night. After discovering her body and hunting for her killer all day, Bert Gildar was settling into his headquarters at the ranger station when there was a knock at the door. Bert, you've got to get up, there's been a grizzly bear mauling. Bert tried calming his colleague, reassuring him that he'd already taken care of it. But the man said, no, there's been another one. Bert would later describe this information as mind-boggling. Glacier National Park spans nearly 1,600 square miles of land and had never had a fatal bear attack. Yet somehow, two campers were attacked on the same night just eight miles apart. Even stranger, both of the victims were 19-year-old women. The previous morning, 18-year-old Roy Ducat, a busboy at the East Glacier Lodge, and 19-year-old Julie Helgeson, a college student who also worked in the lodge as a laundry aide, were planning a fun day in the crisp mountain air. They were described as head over heels for each other and were excited to spend some time together, but first they needed a ride. After a kind Samaritan picked them up, they were off, traveling on the famous Going to the Sun Road. At around 3.30 p.m., the couple arrived at Logan Pass, where they began a 7.6-mile hike along the High Line Trail, heading for the Granite Park Chalet. The fatiguing trek was worth it to them, though. Sitting at an altitude of almost 7,000 feet with a direct view of Heaven's Peak, Granite Park Chalet is a wildly popular stay in Glacier National Park. So popular, in fact, that by the time Roy and Julie arrived, the chalet had already been completely booked for the day. But the young lovebirds were unaffected by this inconvenience. Even after having been warned of frequent bear activity in the area, the couple insisted that they would take their chances. They certainly didn't want to make the grueling hike back down the mountain. So they set up camp 500 yards away from the chalet. As the guests of the Granite Park Chalet drank beer, sang campfire songs, and watched in awe as grizzlies lumbered around the lodge, Roy and Julie snuggled into their sleeping bags and dozed off to sleep. At some point in the night, Roy awoke to Julia's panicked whispers. Shh, she said. Play dead. Startled from a deep sleep, Roy looked up to see a colossal grizzly towering over them. He barely had time to think. With strength equivalent to five men, the bear picked Roy up and hurled him across the campsite. Before he could recover, Roy felt the grizzly's teeth sink into his shoulder, then back, then legs. Though wanting to curl up in pain, Roy played dead the best he could in hopes to ward off the predator. Amazingly, he managed to remain silent throughout the ordeal. After some time, though, the bear turned its attention to Julie. Roy, still playing dead, heard Julie shriek. This bolted him to action. He desperately searched for his flashlight to scare off the bear. However, this is when he noticed that he was missing his left arm. It had been badly severed. Overcome by his injuries, Roy collapsed on the ground, forced to listen in horror as his girlfriend's screams grew increasingly distant. Nearby campers heard the distressing calls for help and ran to aid the couple. They used their flashlight to send a pattern of SOS signals back to the chalet. Shouts from the balcony asked what was the trouble, and the campers yelled back that there had been a bear attack. Newly appointed park ranger Joan Devereaux was in the St. Mary's Ranger Station when the news of a bear attack reached her. 
The guests themselves, unwilling to wait, began assembling a search party, but with very little information to go on, they weren't aware of the gravity of the situation. Many were reluctant to accept that there had truly been an attack. Joan quickly took charge of the 65 chalet guests and they rallied around her lead. She would later receive a Distinguished Service Award for her efforts that night, the Department of the Interior's highest honor. Upon arriving at the scene of the attack, the group stood in shock at the horror before them. Joan immediately discovered the young boy laying on the ground. He was mumbling, but she was able to understand that he was worried about a girl having been dragged off. Joan then called over her radio for backup. Before medical help arrived, the impromptu search party sprung into rescue action. One of the helpers, Riley Johnson, broke into a crew cabin and obtained an old bedspring, which was then used as a gurney to carry Roy to the lodge. A few of the guests were medical doctors and they placed him on a makeshift operating table for medical treatment. Roy was conscious and talking as the doctors tried to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, other searchers were still on the hunt for Julie, but these efforts were interrupted when Joan received word that a helicopter was en route, so she directed the crew to build fires around an impromptu landing pad. As the helicopter was landing, a ranger named Bunny organized a group of six to once again embark on a search for Julie. At the campsite, they saw chaos and personal belongings scattered everywhere, along with a trail of blood leading down the hill. After walking along the trail, they discovered a coin purse, and then the blood disappeared. 342 feet from the campsite, they heard a faint cry. Julie was found lying on her stomach, wearing only her cut-off jean shorts. She had deep lacerations on her arms and legs and suffered from a punctured lung. She repeatedly muttered, It hurts. The gracious helpers wrapped her in a sleeping bag, put her on a bed spring, and carried her back to the chalet. The next morning, the chalet guests made their breakfasts in a somber silence. Even children sensed something was off. The kind guest who helped carry Roy to the chalet, Riley Johnson, counted the guests as each one left, ensuring no one was left behind. Knowing that there should be 60 guests, he started to panic when his count kept coming up with 59. He then remembered his young son was strapped to his back. These two fatal attacks set off an immediate quest to understand how a tragedy of such incalculable odds could have happened. Across the country, theories began swirling. The night before the attacks, on August 12th, a dry lightning storm struck the park, sparking several wildfires. Many believed this could have confused and excited the bears, enraging them enough to maul the two young women. More bizarre theories, such as the women's menstrual cycles and LSD ingestion by the bears, also came into the discussion as possible triggers. However, the cause of this tragedy was concluded to be far more ordinary. Human food and garbage. Park attendance had begun to explode over the past few decades, growing from an annual average of around 100,000 in the 1910s to close to a million in the late 60s. Of course, more people means more trash, and glaciers incinerators simply couldn't contain it all. As a result, excess trash was placed in trenches behind the buildings. It should be noted that some reports claim the park just didn't use the incinerator at all. Of course, to a grizzly, there is no border between their domain and the humans. They would lumber through the park where their powerful sense of smell would lead them straight to the discarded waste. Soon, the bears themselves became a popular tourist attraction. Ranger Bert Gildar and wildlife biologist David Shea reported witnessing five bears devouring trash at the Granite Park Chalet just days before Julie's attack. Both had expressed concern at park headquarters. They later recalled that this was no coincidence but rather an incident waiting to happen. Even on the evening before the attacks, concessioner employees of the chalet discarded dinner ham bones and other scraps deliberately to entice grizzlies to the area in hopes to entertain the guests. Bears were spotted numerous times rummaging through trash left behind by campers and even stalking guests, as mentioned before with the Girl Scouts. But each voice of concern brought no action and reports were swept under the rug. The incidents of that horrific night revolutionized how the public and park officials would deal with grizzly bears. In the days following, rangers were sent to shoot and kill any grizzly who frequented the areas near people. The park also established a policy that eliminated dispersed camping and designated campgrounds for visitors as well as cooking areas. An aggressive bear education program was also put into action. Other strategies such as frequently closing trails so bears can access berry patches and bear-proof garbage cans were also put into place. Despite the preventative measures that could have been taken, Michelle's family takes some measure of solace in knowing that she was instrumental in changing how the National Park Service manages bears, and it's something Michelle would have been proud of. Not only have these efforts saved people's lives, they're also saving bears' lives. Despite stories like these, Glacier National Park remains a statistically safe place to visit. But even still, don't let its rugged beauty fool you into complacency. 
If you visit Glacier, always remember that even in this modern age, as you pass through the park entrance, you are entering the domain of the Grizzly.